Children may be dismissed to Children's Church. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be in verses uh, 8 through 18 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair right in front of you. It's on page 382, page 382 of the, the chair Bible. So <clears throat> this morning we return to our, uh, our study of Elijah. It's been four long weeks, and I know some of you are very anxious to get back to it. So we've been, very, we've been able to learn uh, so much from this prophet of God. A man that we've seen is really just, just like many of us in so many ways. And today we, we continue our look at the prophet who is worn out and discouraged. Most of us are familiar with Elijah's story, but here's a, a quick reminder since it's been a little while since we've been there. So God chooses this previously unknown man from out of nowhere to confront King Ahab, king of Israel. King Ahab and his pagan queen Jezebel had led the people into idolatrous worship of the pagan god Baal. God uses Elijah to confront Ahab for this and to issue God's judgment of a drought upon the land. Then we see God miraculously provide for Elijah over the course of the three years of this drought. First, Elijah hides out at the brook Cherith. And there God provides his food through ravens that bring it to him every day. Then the Lord sends him to Queen Jezebel's own backyard, Zarephath. There Elijah stays with the poor widow woman and her son. We saw the miracle of the same jar of flour and oil never run out through the entire drought, the famine that it caused. During this time, the widow's son dies. We see the power of prayer and faith as he is brought back to life. These three years are a time of provision and preparation for Elijah. Then Elijah returns to confront King Ahab once again. He calls the people to make a choice. God or Baal. He challenged the prophets of Baal in a contest on on Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal are humiliated as, as all their efforts of screaming and jumping around only show the futility of trusting a false god. But then it was Elijah and the Lord's return. Elijah prays a simple prayer. The Lord reveals himself in a dramatic fashion, sending fire from heaven. It consumes all of Elijah's sacrifice. The people fall on their faces. They declare, the Lord, he is God. Amen. Amen. Then God answers Elijah's powerful prayer and persistent prayer, and he sends the rain. An amazing story of an ordinary man being used by God in a profound way. And yet, Elijah's story is a magnificent is an, is an example of what can happen to even, even the most faithful, even after they experience great victories, disappointment, discouragement. And in him we see the things that can cause it. Several weeks ago we found Elijah in the depths of despair, sitting under a broom tree asking God to just take his life. The mighty prophet of God was deeply discouraged and depressed. He had just been used mightily by the Lord. He had expected a a great revival to come to the land. In his mind, the people of Israel would obviously repent and and turn back to God. He thought surely Ahab and Jezebel would, would help call the nation to do this. But this didn't happen. Instead, wicked queen Jezebel threatened his life. He said, you're as good as dead, Elijah. And he reacted in tremendous fear. He ran away from his position, his problem, and his people. He felt as if his, his entire ministry and himself were a complete failure. He ran all the way to the southern border, border of Judah. 
He left his servant. And then he just went and sat despondently under that broom tree. He gave up. And he asked the Lord to just take his life. We looked at some of the things that led Elijah to become so discouraged and depressed. First, we saw that he faced real threats. He had valid concerns. Queen Jezebel said she was going to kill him. And she had the authority and the means to do it. But instead of taking those concerns to the Lord, he let them take him. Instead of controlling his emotions, he allowed them to do the controlling. Then he was physically and emotionally exhausted. He had had a long day on Mount Carmel confronting King Ahab, the people, and, and the prophets of Baal. He had run over 20 miles to Jezreel. He was physically and emotionally drained. And that can cause you to make some pretty irrational decisions. He had some unrealistic expectations, and he experienced some unexpected results. His trust had begun to lean on what he expected God to do and what those results should be. When God didn't operate according to Elijah's wisdom, Elijah was unprepared. He was shaken. That led him to lose focus, begin to wallow in self-pity. Took his eyes off the Lord and he put it on himself and his problems. While Elijah is a picture of someone who is depressed, he's also the portrait of a, of a man who is guilty of sin. He was not only full of self-pity, but he was a bit full of himself too. Verse 4 revealed the truth of that. He said, I guess I'm no better than my father's. I guess I'm no better than my father's. He, as if he thought he was. It's a problem that we're all encouraged to, invo- to avoid. Romans 12, 3. Don't think more highly of yourself than you should. We're constantly reminded as we go through the study of Elijah what James 5, 17 tells us about him. Elijah was a man with a nature just like us. Because of that, we can identify with the, with the very same struggles that he had. But we can also benefit from the very same things to combat sinking into that kind of disappointment and and depression. We looked at the things we can do to help prevent this. Taking our, our real legitimate fears to the Lord, not allowing them to control us, getting the physical and emotional rest and support that we need. The Lord gave us the Sabbath and each other for a reason. Our faith and expectations must be grounded in our confidence in God to do whatever he decides to do, whatever he decides to do, even if it's not what we want or what we expect. We must not take our eyes off Jesus or the gospel, the message that saved us, the message that will save others, that we have a responsibility to share with the world. Certainly God's perfect will for Elijah would have been for him to have stood up to Jezebel. To have led the country in a renewed devotion to the Lord. Of course, we know that's not what happened. Instead, Elijah runs away from everything and he sits under that tree, just wishing he was dead. We then witness how God deals with this fallen man of God. The steps the Lord used to heal and restore him. The same medicine the Lord uses to heal those that find themselves in the same place that we find Elijah. God knew that Elijah needed some things straightened out in his life. God's answer perfectly addresses the makeup of man. The physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. He met his physical needs. He fed him to restore his strength. He let him sleep. He gave him the rest his body desperately needed. He met his emotional needs too. Said that the Lord came near. The Lord came near. Sometimes sometimes you just need somebody to be there. God patiently came alongside Elijah to restore him. Also that Elijah would repent and learn to look to the Lord again. God doesn't 
write Elijah off as a lost cause because he still has plans for him. There is still something for Elijah to accomplish for the Lord. His job isn't done yet, so the Lord would need to prepare him. The Lord had come and brought what was needed to heal Elijah physically and emotionally, but the most important healing was yet to come. That was the spiritual. Elijah still needed to get his heart and his spirit right. His faith needed to be restored. He needed to regain his focus. This was going to be a bit longer of a process. This is where we pick up Elijah's journey. So join me in in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 8. And he rose and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nibsmi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abelamon, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. The one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that have not kissed him. While the Lord was considerate of the prophet's needs, compassionate to him while he worked through his problems, God knew knew the root of the problem had to be dealt with. Elijah had sin and pride in his heart, and they had to be rooted out before the Lord could use him again. These verses tell us how the Lord went about getting Elijah's attention. Elijah gets up and he sets off for Horeb. This is also known as Mount Sinai. It was about 200 miles from from Beersheba to Sinai. A journey of perhaps 10 days to at the most maybe two weeks. Elijah's 40-day journey is not without significance. A A straight trip from Beersheba should have taken less than half of that time. This time was not just literal literal, but it was also purposefully symbolic. The nation of Israel's unbelief and fear led to the judgment for them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Elijah's unbelief and fear led him to spend 40 days in the desert too. Jesus spent 40 days in in the wilderness when he was tempted. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai with the Lord. Sure, All this time in the desert wasn't lost on Elijah. Perhaps he was hoping to have his own mountaintop experience with God. Elijah finally arrives on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Once he does, his spiritual rehab continues. First, we see the challenge in verses 9 and 10. This mountain was a place of great significance for the children of Israel. Here, Moses had met God by a burning bush. Here God had handed down his law to the people of Israel. 
Perhaps Elijah went here so that he might also hear the voice of God. When he, when he arrives, he goes into a cave, perhaps the same one as Moses. Once there, he sits down to wait for God to speak. He's not disappointed. When the Lord speaks, it's to issue a challenge. He'll ask Elijah this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? This question is a rebuke of the prophet. Elijah, what are you doing in a cave on, on Mount Horeb? Didn't I send you to go preach to my people? Shouldn't you be in Israel leading people in a great revival? I didn't call you to run away and hide in this cave. I called you to stand before kings, to, to, to defy false gods and prophets, and be an example of righteousness for the people of Israel. So, Elijah, what are you doing here? It was a call for Elijah to examine his life and his priorities. It's time for Elijah to come face to face with the fact that he had sinned against the Lord. Of course, Elijah replies by talking about all he's done and, and how alone he is. I've been zealous. I've tried really hard. But the people, they just won't listen. I'm the only one left, and, and they want to kill me too. I've faithfully served you, and now, now look at the danger I'm in. To Elijah and many servants of God since, it seemed unfair that a, a faithful servant of God would, should be allowed to suffer. He claims that he's been faithful. But if he was faithful, what was he doing hiding in a cave? Hundreds of miles away from where he was supposed to be. His answer also reveals his pride and self-pity aren't fixed yet. I wonder if the Lord is asking anyone here the same question this morning. What are you doing here? I didn't save you to be in this condition. What's up with all your excuses? I didn't call you to be doing things like that. I called you to serve me. What are you doing here? There have been times when I've heard that gentle rebuke from the Holy Spirit. We allow ourselves to wander from the faithful path and go our own way. We make excuses for our behavior. Well, it's their fault, it's not mine. We, we develop a bad attitude. Well, nobody cares, why should I? We get lazy in our service to God. I mean, I mean, really, why bother? When we walk into open sin, we don't even fight it anymore. When we do, the Lord says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? This is God's way of getting our attention. If he were to speak to you here today, would he have to ask you the same thing? We may not like it at the time, but I thank God for the challenges from the Word of God and from the Spirit of God. Remember Revelation 3.19, he says, Those I love, I rebuke and I discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. The Lord challenges your life. It's only because He loves you. It's only because He loves you. He wants to call you out of the life that you're in. Then we see a command. In verse 11. He said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. Now that he has Elijah's attention, the Lord commands the prophet to stand before him. This is where Elijah should have been all along. God is calling Elijah back to the place of total surrender. To the place where, where nothing was greater in his sight than the Lord. See, Elijah had let Ahab, Jezebel, and the sins of people eclipse God. It's all he could see. He saw Ahab, Jezebel, his problems. God calls him back to that place where, where nothing else but God matters. 
This is a place we all need to be today. Did you know that your problems aren't your problem? Did you know that your trials aren't your problem either? Your depression, your discouragement, your defeat aren't your problem. Did you know that even your sins aren't your problem? When we have problems in life, whether spiritual, material, or emotional, the real root of the problem is something has gotten larger than God in your eyes. If he is all that he claims to be, then what problems are there? If he is really God and he is really in control, then he can take care of any situation. Like Elijah, we must learn to take our hands off the wheel and and give control to the Lord. God knew what the depressed and discouraged Elijah needed. He needed a personal encounter with God. That's the confrontation. While Elijah stood in that cave on Mount Horeb, the Lord passed by. This reminds us of the experience of Moses on the same mountain. Elijah needed a fresh vision of the power and glory of God. First, the Lord caused a a great wind to pass by, a wind so strong that it broke the rocks and it tore the mountain. But the Lord was not in the wind. Then an earthquake that shook, shook the mountain to its foundation. The Lord was not in the earthquake. After that, there was a great fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Elijah must have thought of Moses' experiences when he, when he witnessed these dramatic displays of power. You remember what, what Moses experienced when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God descended upon Mount Sinai in thunder and earthquakes and fire, all on this very mountain. Elijah knew those stories, but now the, the Lord is not in any of those. After those dramatic displays, there's a sound of a low whisper. I love the the King James translation of a still, small voice. This voice caused Elijah to come out of the cave. I don't know what the voice whispered. Whatever it was, Elijah knew that it was the Lord. What that earthquake and that fire could not do, the still, small voice did. Touched Elijah's heart. This is what Elijah needed, and it taught him a couple of lessons. First, he he needed to know that God isn't always interested in the great flashy things that impress men. Elijah was used to the remarkable. He was used to to being astounded. After all, who else had been fed by the ravens? Who else saw God feed three people with with a flour jar and a jug of oil that never ran out? Who else had seen someone raised from the dead? Who else had rebuked a king and lived? Who else had defied 450 Baal prophets, prayed fire down from heaven, and then killed the prophets? Elijah is used to the spectacular. We're guilty of the same thing, aren't we? When we see great things happening, we get excited. When we see the church growing, people getting saved, shouting, all the wonderful things we we all like to see, we get fired up and we talk about all the, the Lord is doing and moving. Surely this is evidence that God is at work. We expect him to do the same thing in our lives too. We expect to see these, these huge things happen in our life. When it doesn't happen that way, we get discouraged. Maybe we even begin to doubt a little bit. God doesn't always operate those big ways. Forget sometimes that God doesn't always move in big, visible, outward manifestations. Often the greatest works of God are done in the secret places of the heart. God wants to teach him that it is God's work in the heart of an individual that is truly important. 
The essence of God is in his relationship and his communication to the person. The Lord reveals himself in his gentle voice. God cares enough to talk to us personally. We know that he loves us. He could scare us to death with his power. But instead, he speaks gently to our hearts. I wonder if the reason that we don't hear from God more often is because there's too much noise in our lives. Sometimes in life, we we just have to be still and know that he is God. Sometimes when we get discouraged, we need to stop looking for the superficial and get refocused on the substantive. There are times when we need to get alone with God and hear the gentle and sure assurance of his grace. God's voice in our life doesn't always come in the ways we expect him to. But that doesn't mean that he's not speaking. Just because God is not working like you expected him to doesn't mean that he is any less at work. Most often, the most important and powerful work he does is in the quiet of an individual's heart. And thus, you're trained to recognize God's voice. You, you might mistake it as just a passing thought. I believe God would like to talk to all of us. Too often, we're just not listening. So much noise in our life. So little quiet. God's gentle voice gets lost in all the clutter. But I also know that God is fully capable of getting our attention if he needs to. That's not always a pleasant experience. Sometimes you don't want him to show up as an earthquake. Right? Or as a fire, a rushing wind. Sometimes we, we expect those massive displays until it comes roaring into our life. He will use those if he needs to. He would prefer, he would rather us listen to him willingly and attentively. The more time we spend with him, the easier it will be to recognize his voice. Truth is, you and I will get discouraged in life. People will disappoint us. Circumstances will sometimes overwhelm us. I want you to notice the gentle message the Lord speaks to Elijah. At the end here, he sends him back to where he just came from. Go back and anoint two kings, Haziel and Jehu. Jehu would replace the corrupt Ahab and Jezebel. See, God had more work for Elijah to do. After restoring him, he he gave him a new purpose, something to accomplish. Then he tells Elijah that there are 7,000 that haven't bent their their knee to Baal. Despite what Elijah felt, He was not alone. He was not alone. And neither are you. Neither are you. No matter what you're going through, take time to listen to the Lord speak to your heart. What is he telling you? What is he telling you? Is the Lord speaking to your heart? Do you hear that still, small voice? Is he calling you back to himself? Listen. Come to him. Has he given you a new task to accomplish for the kingdom? Go. Step into his plan for your life. Do you feel alone? Look around for the family that he has provided you. Get yourself rooted into a church that that can encourage you. We're not meant to be alone. But I hope we've learned today is that in those times we don't need 
to run away. We need not despair. What we need to do is rest, refocus, and listen. Listen carefully for the assuring whispers of His grace as He speaks to us. Listen for that still, small voice. What is He telling you? Listen. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we we come to You again. Father, we recognize that Elijah is a man just like us. We are just like Elijah. And oftentimes we can lose focus. We can can choose to run away. We can get caught up in our own problems and our own life and begin to feel self-pity and self-righteous and think that we can go our own way till we eat till we eventually reach the end. Father God, we we thank you that you are patient and gentle. And you come to us, you meet us where we are. And you will give us what we need. Father, you will provide our physical needs. You will give us what our bodies require. You will give us the rest You will give us the nourishment. Father, that you give us the emotional support and you just come alongside us just to feel your presence brings us peace and comfort. And Father, you call us back to yourself. You speak to us. You speak to our hearts. You don't always do it in big, flashy ways. Father, I pray that you would help us to listen to that still, small voice as you gently speak to our heart. Father, that we would hear. We would hear. We would listen. And we would come. We would come back to you. Father, that we would go wherever it is you send us. Father, that we would Recognize that we are not alone. That you have given us a family of like-minded believers to, to come alongside us, to support us, and to encourage us. Father, I pray that you would help us to find that family and to remain rooted in them. Father, we thank you that you never give up on us. And just like Elijah, you still have something for us to accomplish. You gave Elijah a new mission, a new purpose. Father, I pray that you would do the same for each of us. Father, that we would come to you, we would return. Father, that we would go and do whatever it is that you have us to do. Thank you that you love and care for us and you meet us exactly where we are. Pray that you would speak to us, that we would listen. Thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's turn to 656 as we close together. Take
Take time to be holy. Let Him come to you and may He meet you right where you are. Provide all that you need. May He bring you the rest, the strength, the courage, and the restoration that you need. May you listen to His voice as He speaks to you. Amen? Go. The power and the strength of the Lord. a time of potluck.